Hello, thank you all for uh, joining us today. This is Dave Turk with the uh, IA, and you've joined a webinar on our Tracking Clean Energy uh, Progress 2019 analysis. Uh, this will be a tag team webinar from a whole series of us, the relevant experts for the different sectors that we'll be going through uh, as part of these, uh, this webinar. But uh, we thought it useful to start with a bit of context and scene setting before we get into the particular sectors and technologies that make up our Tracking Clean Energy uh, progress analysis. So let me just start a uh, big picture on the overall uh, CO2 emissions. Um, CO2 emissions uh, um, from the energy sector. Now, as most of you know, the bulk of CO2 emissions uh, come from the energy sector, 85 or so percent. And so what you see in front of you on the screen is the uh, number of additions or decreases the annual change in global energy-related CO2 emissions since 2014. Uh, in a very promising fashion, uh, from 2014 to 2015 to 2016, we saw quite flat emissions overall coming from the energy sector, um, even though we had a pretty robust global GDP growth. So we were hoping that this was the decoupling uh, that we have been wanting to see between emissions and GDP growth. Unfortunately, what we saw, saw in 2017 was we have not decoupled emissions from GDP growth. 2017 saw a 1.6% increase uh, in CO2 emissions globally from the energy sector. And 2018, uh, we actually saw an even bigger increase. So we saw a 1.7% increase from the energy sector in emissions. Just to give you a sense of scale of what that 1.7% represents, that actually represents a whole additional international aviation sector. All the emissions from all the airplanes that we fly on um, added to um, what we've already, uh, what we're already putting out there as of 2017. So that is a huge volume of additional new emissions into the overall, uh, overall system. Um, now let's just take a, a look at that um, on a longer term horizon, especially looking forward. What you see in front of you on the screen, that blue line is what we call our new policy scenario, which includes very importantly, the NDCs, the nationally determined contributions. What this can be thought of is uh, the current trajectory under current levels of ambition. Where does that take us uh, going forward into the future? And what you see there is emissions increasing, increasing a little slower than what we've seen uh, historically and in the recent past, but increasing all the way to 2040. Now that differs significantly from the green line you now see on your screen, what we call our sustainable development scenario. This is a well below two Paris compliant scenario. It also incorporates uh, very significant reductions in air pollution, uh, as well as universal uh, access to electricity under SDG seven. The delta between those two is the blue where we're currently headed under existing levels of ambition and the green where we've set ourselves to go um, from these global, uh, global uh, agreements. That is obviously a big difference. The green showing a peaking very early and steep reductions uh, thereafter and you see in front of you going to, uh, to, to 2040. Um, I'll fill in what we call our wedge chart, which these are the levers, if you will, efficiency renewables, and you'll see this time and time again in the various sectors and technologies when we get into this uh, webinar, the levers that can be used to get us from that blue line to that green line. And the analysis that we're here to share today, this tracking clean energy progress, is fundamentally looking sector by sector, technology by technology, um, both what are the latest data that we have from the IA on all these sectors and technologies, what's the latest numbers, um, in terms of deployment, in terms of cost, in terms of other uh, investment, other numbers, as well as uh, is that particular sector and technology doing its share to get us from that blue to the green? So what you see in front of you is the overall snapshot of our analysis um, that just came out um, and is now live on our website. You see in front of you 45 different sectors and technologies all grouped accordingly. Um, if something is red, that means it's not making much progress at all. And so it's much more towards that top line there in terms of the current levels of ambition. If it's yellow, it's making some progress, but not nearly as much as it needs to. And if it's green, that means that that particular technology and sector or sector is actually doing its share to get us to that sustainable development scenario, to get us to 
uh, that well below two scenario. What you see on the screen in front of you uh, shows only seven of those 45 sectors and technologies being on track. Uh, obviously, um, that is not where we want to be. We'd ideally see all of the sectors and technologies that are green. Uh, you see 22 yellow uh, and 16 red. And what we'll be doing today is going through each of these in turn, different colleagues who are the experts and leads for each of these sectors, power, fuel supply, industry, transport, buildings, and energy integration, going um, through each of them, sharing with you, again, the latest numbers that we have, 2018 numbers, uh, usually for each of these sectors and technologies, and providing some of the most interesting insights, uh, insights for all of you today uh, across the landscape of the, uh, the energy space. Um, let me just conclude my portion of this introduction to just make, um, make abundantly clear all the information that we're uh, going to go through today is available free and uh, to everyone in the public on our TCEP, on our Tracking Clean Energy Progress web portal. You see the link there in front of you. Certainly, uh, if you have a second screen, you can pull up the slide presentation and then also surf around uh, on the web portal itself. Uh, this is not a written publication. We've gone to a web portal full model that allows us to update these numbers on a routine basis. And we very much hope this is a resource anytime you want to find out what is the latest number in this sector or technology. How is this sector or technology doing? Where does it need to go uh, going into the future? So we very much hope that this web portal model continually updated is one that you'll find helpful to come back to again and again for whatever kind of uh, research and analysis and information uh, that you want to uh, have in front of you. So with that, let me turn it over to our first, uh, first category. Um, Davide is going to take us through the power sector, and we'll go through all of these categories. We'll go through quite quickly. We'll share a lot of information with you, um, and then we'll take questions at the uh, very end. So. Um, please feel free to start sending in your questions during the webinar, and then we'll take those as quickly as we can uh, at the very end, and happy to follow up uh, further beyond this webinar as well. So with that, let me turn it over to Davide, who will take us through the uh, power sector and the, the most relevant findings there. Thank you, Dave. Um, global electricity demand increased 4% in uh, 2018, with low carbon generation expanding 6% to meet um, a considerable share of this growth. Nevertheless, coal remained the largest source of electricity generation, with an, incre with an increase of 2.6%. 42% of all energy-related CO2 emissions came from the power sector in 2018, and Coal accounts for 80% of these emissions, which grew 2.6% in 2017 and a further 2.5% in 2018. In, in contrast, emissions in the SES fall on average 4.1% per year to 2030. After stalling in 2017, the carbon intensity of power generation uh, slightly declined 1.3% in 2018 to around 480 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. This resulted from a 7% increase in renewables generation, uh, but which was also offset by 2%, 2.6% increase in coal-based generation. The decline seen in uh, the SES is of 3.4% per year and reaches around 220 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour in 2030. This, is a, this considerable reduction in power generation intensity is one of the cornerstones of the SES, also considering the increasing um, use of uh, electricity in the end use sector. Achieving this reduction will entail a significant shifts in the technology mix for power generation, and most of new capacity additions should be uh, low carbon. However, we should note that across different regions and countries, the situation is very different, and solutions uh, should be tailored to specific situations.
Worldwide, nuclear is the second largest low carbon source of electricity today and provides about 10% of electricity supply, only behind hydropower. Currently, there are 452 reactors around the world that generate 2,700 terawatt hours of electricity. In 2018, 11.2 gigawatts of new nuclear capacity was connected to power grids, the highest total since 1990. But these were concentrated in just two countries, China and Russia. And China completed the first EPR and the first AP1000 reactors which are generation three designs with enhanced safety features. Nuclear power has avoided close to 60 gigatons of CO2 emissions over the past 50 years. In the LCS, we see a remarkable increase in nuclear capacity additions compared to current trends. However, little new construction is on the horizon and plants are beginning to close Without additional construction, nuclear capacity operating in advanced economies will, will reach just over 280 gigawatts and provides 18% uh, of electricity supply today. By 2025, one qu quarter of this capacity could be retired. And by 2040, operating nuclear capacity would decline by two thirds to just over 90 gigawatts in advanced economies. This would reduce electricity generation from nuclear noticeably and in 2040 the nuclear share of generation would fall to just 6% in advanced economies. Accelerate innovation in new reactor designs such as small modular reactors that can help expand the suits of clean energy technologies and lower costs through standardization and economies of scale could address some of the barriers from existing nuclear technologies. However, we should consider that with planned constructions and planned uh, lifetime extensions, we still see an increase in nuclear capacity. Coal remains firmly in place as the largest source of power at 38% of generation. It is still increasing and it increased 3% in 2018 and in 2017. And now, and in 2018, produced more than 10,000 terawatt hours of electricity. Developments differ among regions and its growth is concentrated mainly in Asia, in particular in China and India, with decreases in the US and in Europe. Coal power accounts for around one third of CO2 emissions today. The long lifetime of power plants, the young age of the coal fleet, and many projects still under construction, represent more than one third of cumulative locked-in emissions to 2014. To reach the SDS trajectory, which, is a, which sees a coal-fired power, coal power without CCUS decrease by nearly 6% per year until 2030, policies and measures targeting the deployment of carbon capture and storage and limiting the lifetime of unabated coal plants are urgently needed. Twenty eighteen was another strong year for gas. Gas fire power generation increased by four percent. Developments were led by strong generation growth in the United States and China. In the US, gas use as a flexible transition fuel increases until the late 2020s, displacing unabated coal. Gas-based generation emits less CO2 than coal-fired generation, and it can deliver immediate emission reductions when it displaces coal. 
However, gas without CCUS declined steadily in the SDS from 2030 onwards. That is also the reason for our indicator for gas fire to remain yellow. We don't yet see the commitment needed for CCUS uh, with natural gas that would provide confidence in achieving uh, SDS by 2030. At the moment, only two large-scale CCUS power projects are in operation, with a combined capture capacity of only 2.4 million tons of CO2. CCUS in power is well off track to reach the 2030 SDS level of 350 megatons of CO2 per year. Current projects in the pipeline are nine for power generation, and four of which four in China, two in Korea, and one in the UK, Ireland, and Netherlands. These projects have the potential to raise the capture capacity to some 18 megatons per year. This is still very low. Recent announcements and technology innovations provide further encouraging signs for the future of CCUS. However, much more needs to be done. I now pass the floor to my colleague Amy, who will cover renewable power. Thank you, uh, Davide. Um, so, renewable power uh, is basically needs improvement overall, but we look at um, uh, sub-technologies within the renewable power, um, and uh, two of these technologies uh, are, um, are on track. Uh, three of them needs improvement, and three others uh, are not on track, as you can see uh, on the screen. Um, there's one important change this year. We improved uh, the tracking status of uh, bioenergy. Uh, and uh, basically solar PV remains the, uh, the, the well on track uh, to reach the uh, SDS uh, with the recent development. Uh, just to clarify, for the, for the tracking um, methodology of renewable power, we look at two separate things. Uh, first, we look at the capacity additions, which means how many plants are going to be built, uh, which then reflects the generation which you see on the screen. Um, we combined this analysis with our forecast, which we publish annually, and made the assessment uh, accordingly uh, based on the recent trends that we see in 2018. Uh, on top, we add our forecast, and then we see how, uh, which technologies are on track um, and, um, and not on track. Um, the reason why we improved the, the bioenergy tracking status is basically recent policy changes in two major markets. Uh, these are uh, China and India. Uh, China's push for, uh, for bioenergy uh, over the last two years uh, showed its result by increasing generation and capacity in 2018 and 2017 as well. Uh, and in India, uh, there is a lot of biogas generation that is coming online through the uh, ethanol uh, uh, industry where a lot of waste products are used to produce uh, electricity in generation plants. Uh, that's why we saw last year uh, an important jump for bioenergy uh, generation. Um, so uh, when we move the solar PV, the, the technology which is, uh, which is sorry, when we move to the overall uh, renewables in terms of the capacity additions last year, um, uh, solar PV was basically compensating for uh, the, the basically losing a momentum for wind uh, and hydro and, uh, and uh, other technologies over the last uh, three years since 2015. And renewable overall capacity additions uh, increased over the last uh, 20 years, basically. However, in 2018, uh, we saw a flattening of the renewable capacity additions, uh, around 180 gigawatts. Uh, this, the reason behind this is basically, uh, there are a few reasons, but the most important one is the flattening additions of solar PV after an exponential growth over the last three years. Um, uh, the flattening of solar PV additions uh, basically is due to change in policy in China. Uh, meanwhile, we saw a slight increase of wind additions, uh, uh, also driven by China and the European Union, um, uh, as well as a declining, continuous declining of hydropower additions, 
because of several large markets uh, such as Brazil and China are not uh, developing as much large project as before. Um, so when we look at uh, hydropower, I will highlight uh, two or three technologies in their generation. First, I'd like to start with the hydropower uh, because actually uh, being on track for renewables depends really highly on the hydropower because it represents today 61% of all renewable generation uh, and its additions have been declining. Uh, uh, as you can see, the growth of the generation that we see is, is slightly, it's, gro it's still growing, but when you look at the capacity additions that will deliver the generation, we see an important decline. And in order to reach the SDS uh, levels, Hydro, hydropower additions actually need to increase and the generation need to increase faster than you see on the screen. Um, and without this, uh, it's actually uh, very difficult for renewables to be on track overall. Um, and uh, the reason why hydropower additions have been declining is due to the uh, development of large-scale plants due to social acceptance issues in many countries uh, remains an important challenge for the, for the new additions. Uh, and in SDS, actually, instead of declining uh, uh, hydropower additions, we should see an increasing hydropower uh, uh, additions through uh, 2030. Uh, that's why I would like to. I want to start with hydropower. Uh, the next one is solar PV. Uh, in 2018, solar PV electric generation increased by about a third. Uh, one of the fastest uh, increased uh, uh, power technology, actually, uh, in terms of the. Uh, absolute growth also in terms of the percentage increase. Um, it remains basically the brightest spot of the, uh, of the renewable power, uh, despite actually the, uh, the declining or stalling uh, uh, capacity additions, we did not change the tracking of the solar PV uh, because actually our forecast shows that this stalling trend uh, for PV will not remain. Uh, and uh, uh, we will see an increasing, uh, the additions go back uh, on track to increase. That's why we kept actually the solar PV's uh, tracking status the same. Um, I would like to talk, ah, sorry, uh, that, was the, that was the last slide on my side and I'm passing on to my colleague, uh, Glenn, for the, uh, to continue with the fuel supply. Yes, thank you very much. Um, this is actually the first year that we have included uh, fuel supply um, in the CCAP. Uh, and one of the reasons is that uh, oil and natural gas, they are said to remain part of the energy system in all of the IEA scenarios. Um, so therefore, we have more attention for uh, indirect emissions from producing, transporting, and processing of oil and gas. Um, as, as you can see on this slide, uh, the total indirect greenhouse emissions from oil and gas operations today is equal to around 5,200 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So that is 15% of total energy sector greenhouse gas emissions. And if you want to know, you can compare that to the total CO2 emissions of the U.S. energy sector altogether. Half of these indirect emissions from the oil and gas operations come from methane emissions and flaring. So in the SDS, the volume of flaring and methane emissions need to go down from around 2,600 million tons of CO2 equivalent to around 600 million tons CO2 equivalent by the year of 2030. If you think about it, that is a decrease of 80% that needs to be realized in 10 years. So an immediate step change in policy ambition, industry buy-in is required, along with technological progress on detecting, measuring, and avoiding emissions. So let's go uh, to the one level deeper. Um, so we look here at global methane emissions from oil and gas operations on this slide. Um, so we see an increasing trend for, for global methane emissions. So in total, the concentration of methane in the atmosphere is around two and a half times higher than pre-industrial levels. The understanding of the scale of methane emissions from oil and gas supply, it's continuing to evolve, but we estimate that around 36 million tons of methane emissions come from oil production and 44 million tons from the production, processing, and transport of natural gas. So 
So there's a wide variety of technologies and measures available to reduce these emissions. If we would deploy all the options which are available today across the oil and gas value chains, we estimate that this would avoid around 75% of these emissions. But more importantly, we estimate that around 45% of the 79 million tons could be avoided with measures that would have no net cost. Some of the solutions to reduce methane emissions include leak detection and repair programs and the installation of paper recovery units on crude oil and condensate storage tanks. In the absence of these units, dissolved methane can evaporate and be vented to the atmosphere. One important initiative that has uh, been started in 2017 is the Methane Guiding Principles which is a multi-stakeholder collaborative platform incorporating over 20 institutions from industry, intergovernmental organizations such as the IA, academia and civil society. So the next one is flaring emissions. In 2017, around 140, 140 billion cubic meters was flared. That is equal to Africa's gas consumption. It's a slight decrease from 2010, but higher than in 2000. Most flared gas is converted into CO2, but it's not all flared, so there will be also a part, a part will be uh, released as methane emissions. Russia, Iraq, Iran, and the United States account for almost half of the flaring globally. The World Bank has just released new data on flaring, so it's not captured in this, in this graph, but it shows that in 2018, global flaring was up with 3%. So if you think that for flaring, we need to go down with 82% by 2025, we are not going into the right direction, and therefore you see that the traffic light is red. Um, so US flaring, was more than increased more than 50 percent uh, compared to 2017, um, and it's, the flaring volumes is now around 14.1 BTM. Um, so various companies, governments, and institutions have endorsed the zero routine flaring by 2030 initiative, but most of the efforts are still voluntary. Um, I will pass on to the uh, next sector, which is presented by Peter Levi, and that's the, in the industry sector. Thanks very much, Glenn. So I'm going to start by providing a high-level overview of, of industry, and just a summary of where we're at. Before I do, I just want to say a special thanks to Tiffany Bass, my colleague who is instrumental in putting this work together. And so while there are pockets of progress in certain subsectors within industry and important initiatives underway to lay the groundwork for substantial emissions reductions, uh, the industry sector as a whole would need to modify its current trajectory substantially in order to keep on track with the SDS. Of the key energy intensive subsectors we examine in detail in TSEP, um, none are judged to be on track today. Furthermore, CCUS for industrial applications is seeing particularly lackluster progress. Um, relative to the deployment required in, in the SDS. While energy efficiency has improved in certain sectors, growing demand has offset much of these gains. A number of projects to develop uh, innovative low carbon production processes are underway, but overall progress in innovation, in innovation is falling short of what is needed uh, to enable deep CO2 emissions reduction. In a nutshell, far more effort is needed to ensure an SDS compatible pathway is maintained for the industry sector. So first, let's look at the broader context of industrial emissions. Direct industrial CO2 emissions rose by 0.3% to reach around 8.5 gigatons of CO2 in 2017, which is about 24% of global energy sector CO2 emissions, including process emissions. This growth represents a slight rebound from the 1.5% annual decline during the period of 2014 to 2016. To maintain an SDS compatible pathway, emissions must peak prior to 2025 and declined to around 8.3 gigatons of CO2 by 2030, despite considerable growth in output during this period. Around two thirds of direct industrial CO2 emissions can be attributed to five groups of materials, which you can see here on the chart. Now let's look at the energy context. 
The industrial sector accounted for about 37% or 156 exajoules of global, total global final energy consumption in 2017. This represents around a 1% annual increase in energy consumption since 2010. Growth was higher than in this long run average in 2017, registering a 1.7% increase, much higher than the rate of 0.1% the previous year. Growth in energy consumption has been driven largely by an ongoing, ongoing trend of rising production in energy intensive subsectors. Now let's look at activity. So demand for materials is a major determinant of the total energy consumption and CO2 emissions of industry subsectors, which in turn is driven by demand for material services. As the stock of materials in a society increases, it tends to reach a point at which it saturates and then demand plateaus. In many industrialized economies, the stock of infrastructure and consumer goods is already saturated, but in many developing economies, material stocks are just getting going. In the past couple of decades, global demand growth for key energy intensive materials has exceeded population growth and for many materials, even GDP growth. Growth since 2000 has been particularly high, largely driven by rapid economic development in China. Recent estimates suggest, however, that global demand for certain materials has plateaued in the last two to three years, particularly demand for cement and to some extent steel and aluminium. Again, China is the key explanatory factor behind this. This notwithstanding, we project growth in other emerging economies to drive up material demand again in coming years. Material efficiency strategies are a key tools to help reduce some of the burden on other CO2 emissions mitigation strategies uh, in the SDS. In 2017, mandatory policy-driven energy efficiency targets and standards covered around 40% of total industrial energy use in most regions, with no major increases in coverage relative to the previous year. While a number of countries have minimum energy performance standards for electric motors, few have mandatory overall performance targets for industrial firms and sectors. China and India are some of the strongest performers on policy coverage, having put in place mandatory targets for energy savings in the industry sectors several years ago that are still in place today. The 100, 1000 and 10,000 enterprise programs in China and the Perform Achieve Trade scheme in India are key components of this coverage. Now to delve into a bit of subsector detail and look at the top three sectors from an emissions perspective. Firstly, cement. Uh, from 2014 to 2017, the direct CO2 intensity of cement production increased by 0.3% per year. The main cause has been an increase in the global clinker to cement ratio, driven by a local shortage of other cement cementitious materials in China, which is responsible for more than half of global cement production. Despite this, there's been a, a positive trend in thermal energy efficiency of cement production, with the energy intensity of clinker production declining by 0.4% per year uh, since 2014. In the SDS, this trend needs to continue, and the average proportion of alternative fuels used in kilns needs to triple from current levels, reaching 18% of thermal energy demand by kilns in 2030. Other efforts will also be uh, needed to reduce cement sector emissions, such as the increased use of clinker substitutes and the deployment of CCUS, and the ad adoption of material efficiency strategies. So now moving to steel. While the energy intensity of crude steel production has gradually fallen since 2009, expanding production from 2009 <coughs> to 2014 led to an increase in overall energy demand and CO2 emissions in the sector. After a small decline in 2014, uh, between 2014 and 2016, energy demand increased in 2017, primarily as a result of higher steel production. The steel sector is currently highly reliant on coal, which supplies around three quarters of its energy demand. And in the S it's SDS, the energy intensity of crude steel production needs to decline by 1% annually to 2030. These short-term CO2 emissions reductions could come largely from uh, energy efficiency improvements and increased scrap production, uh, scrap-based production, which would enable more scrap-based electric arc furnace deployments. Longer-term reductions in the steel sector's emissions will require the adoption of new uh, direct reduced iron, or DRI, and smart reduction technologies that facilitate the integration of low-carbon electricity and CCUS. The groundwork for uh, getting these breakthrough processes off the ground, though, needs to be laid before 2030 in order for the sector to get on track with its longer term goals. Now, last among the three sectors, uh, we just want to take a quick look at chemicals. Direct energy related CO2 emissions from the chemical sector 
reached around 1.25 gigatons in 2017, a 2% increase from the previous year. The growth in emissions has largely been driven by strong growth in demand for, uh, uh, for chemical products, including plastics and fertilizers. For example, uh, demand for high-value chemicals, which are the key pre precursors to most plastics, increased by nearly 5% in a single year between 2016 and 2017. Despite an expected increase of 30% in demand for primary chemicals, chemical sector emissions need to, depend, uh, to peak and return to today's levels by 2030 to stay on track with the SDS. As a result, the emissions intensity of chemical production must decline through efforts such as reducing the share of coal use for process energy and feedstock and the deployment of CCUS. And lastly, just to revisit CCUS uh, in industry, uh, carbon capture, utilization, and storage can play a key role in reducing CO2 emissions from the industrial sector and also from fuel transformation and power. But in 2018, um, we only saw one more industrial CCUS project that came, on, uh, came online in China, bringing the total number of projects in industry and fuel transformation to 16, with a ratio capacity of 28 million tons of CO2 capture per year. Six new industrial products, uh, projects are under development in Europe, with three linked to low carbon hydrogen production. While this progress is positive, it is a long way from where we need to be. In the SDS, around 400 million tons of capacity is required by 2030, and nearly 1.5 gigatons by 2040. The current trajectory of CCUS deployment is far from being on track with the SDS, and, the consider and considerable efforts are needed to accelerate investment and progress in this critical technology area. And now just to provide a roundup of, of some of the enabling mechanisms and key actions that are required. The clean energy transition in industry is uh, not likely to materialize as per the SDS um, as a result of market forces alone. Uh, policies will be critical. So a few important examples of these are as follows. So firstly, we need to accelerate progress on energy and material efficiency. This includes deployment of best available technologies uh, and energy efficiency uh, mechanisms and incentives to, to facilitate those. Um, we need to improve the collection rates and, and sorting of uh, recycled products, which can help increase uh, lower, lower energy consuming secondary process routes. And government mandated recycling requirements can also uh, help improve these collection rates for these materials. <coughs> uh, secondly, we need to increase the uptake of renewable heat. Best practice waste management can improve the availability of municipal solid waste for use in industries such as cement. Where possible, electrification of industrial processes can increase the scope for use of renewable energy. Lastly, we need to accelerate innovation and the deployment of low carbon technologies. Innovation over the next decade will therefore be critical to develop and reduce the cost of industrial processes and technologies that could enable substantial emissions cuts post-2030, including, for example, hydrogen-based production of certain materials and the deployment of CCUS um, in conjunction with this and standalone. Increased support for research, development, and uh, demonstration is needed from governments and, and financial investment investors particularly to advance the large-scale demonstration and deployment of technologies that have already shown promise. It will also be important to begin planning and developing infrastructure for eventual deployment of innovative, innovative processes, such as CCUS pipeline networks uh, for transport and storage. That's it for industry, and I'll be around at the end of the presentation to take your questions. I'm going to now hand over to Jacob to talk about transport. Thank you, Peter. Uh, much like many of the other sectors, the transport sector is in a critical transition period. Existing measures to improve vehicle and systems level efficiency and reduce energy demand must be deepened and extended for compliance with the sustainable development scenario. The transport sector will need to undergo a major transformation, including vastly improving the efficiency of moving people and goods, and shift from oil to electricity and other low carbon energy carriers. Transport is responsible for nearly one quarter of direct CO2 emissions from fuel combustion. Road vehicles, cars, trucks, buses, and two and three wheelers account for nearly three quarters of transport CO2 emissions, a share that has stayed essentially constant over the past two decades. Meanwhile, emissions from aviation and shipping continue to rise, demonstrating the need for more international action in these hard to evade sectors. Global transport emissions increased by only 0. 6% in 2018, compared with 1.6% annually in the past decade, 
owing to efficiency improvements, electrification, and greater use of biofuels. So the rate of growth in transport emissions is slowing down, but absolute sector emissions will need to begin to, de to decline in the coming decade to achieve the SDS goal. Looking first at electric vehicles, although the global share of electric mobility is still small, about half of 1% of cars on the road today are plug-in or battery electric, the EV fleet is expanding quickly. Ambitious policy announcements have been critical in stimulating the electric mobility transition in major vehicle markets over the past few years. The global stock of electric vehicles passed the 5 million mark in 2018, with nearly half, 45% of electric cars on the road located in China, up from China having just 8% of the global fleet only five years ago. 2018 was marked by continuous policy and technology announcements in many regions and countries, and global electric car sales accelerated compared to previous years. For a more detailed deep dive into the shifting landscape of policy incentives, the main market players, and their targets for electrification in the coming decade, and the challenges facing electric mobility in various modes and environments, as well as potential solutions to those challenges, I'd like to invite you to take a look at the Global Electric Vehicle Outlook 2019, which uh, should be available for free at the IEA website, at website from tomorrow onward. Shifting now to fuel economy of light duty vehicles, average fuel economy improvements of new vehicle sales in advanced economies slowed to only 0.2% between 2016 and 2017 with the trend even reversing in almost 20 countries. In contrast, the rate of improvement in emerging economies has accelerated from about 0.2% in the first five years in which we began tracking this, 2005 to 2010, to 2.3% in the past two years. The net result at a global level is that average fuel consumption of light duty vehicles improved by only 0.7% in 2017, slowing down from the 2005 to 2016 rate of 1.8% per year. But to get on track with the SDS, which is aligned with the targets of the Global Fuel Economy Initiative, an annual improvement of 3.7% is needed. Hopeful signs include ambitious but achievable CO2 standards passed in the EU, the extension of fuel economy standards to 2030 in Japan, and a proposal for stricter standards to 2025 in China. Rapid adoption of electric vehicles will also help to achieve efficiency goals. At the same time that standards are being rolled out, it's vital that they become much more stringent and that vehicles comply with them in real world driving conditions. Again, I'd like to invite uh, listeners to uh, look for the latest fuel economy tracking uh, report uh, at the IEA website uh, by Googling, for instance, the Global Fuel Economy Initiative uh, and the IEA. Shifting now to heavy-duty vehicles, emissions from trucks and buses have risen at a rate of 2.2% annually since uh, the year 2000. Policy coverage of heavy-duty vehicles still lags behind that of light-duty vehicles by about a decade, but policy momentum has been growing. With new policies adopted in India in 2018 and in the EU, uh, expected adoption of, of HDV CO2 standards uh, taking place just next month. More than half of HDVs sold worldwide will be covered by fuel economy and CO2 emission standards. In the near term, vehicle efficiency standards, together with coordinated efforts by multiple stakeholders to improve logistics and operational efficiency of trucks, are needed to dampen this growth in CO2 emissions. Building upon recent momentum, rapid adoption of battery electric buses and trucks in cities will not only, only reduce energy consumption, but also cut local pollutant and CO2 emissions. Finally, one of the hardest to abate road sectors, heavy duty trucks with regional and long haul emissions, which account for three quarters of heavy duty, fuel, heavy duty vehicle fuel consumption, will need to transition to low carbon alternative fuels and powertrains. Options include electrification, hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles, advanced biofuels, and electrofuels. Moving on now to biofuels, transport biofuel production expanded 7% year-on-year in 2018, and 3% annual production growth is expected over the coming five years. This, however, falls short of the sustained 10% out output growth needed per year until 2030 to align with the SDS. Stronger policy support and innovation to reduce costs 
are required to scale up both advanced biofuel consumption and the adoption of biofuels in aviation and maritime transport as envisioned in the SDS. As only sustainable biofuels have a place in the sustainable development scenario, more widespread sustainability governance must complement higher biofuel output. While transport biofuels are off, tra off track globally, especially as the US and EU hit upon blending limits and peaking and even declining road transport fuel demand, without higher blend limits or greater adoption of drop-in biofuels, uh, the US and the EU are likely to fall short of the SDS goals. However, new ambitious policies in, in countries like China and India and the ASEAN region are on course to meet SDS demand. Energy efficiency in aviation improved by 3.2% per year between the year 2000 and 2014, but slowed to less than 1% per year between 2014 and 2016. In the SDS, aviation energy efficiency needs to improve by more than 3% per year to 2040. With global aviation activity continuing to grow rapidly, more rapidly than in any other mode, further in international policy measures such as more stringent carbon pricing and efficiency standards could help put aviation on the SDS pathway. Shifting now to international shipping, one of the most uh, promising pro signs of progress on a, on a policy level came in April 2018 when the International Maritime Organization agreed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50% by 2050 compared with a 2008 baseline with carbon intensity reduction targets as well for 2030 and 2050. However, even with all the policy measures currently in place and proposed, CO2 emissions from international shipping are projected to be 50% higher in 2040 than they were in 2008. This gap between the ambitions of the IMO greenhouse gas emission reduction strategy and the uh, uh, trajectory reveals the urgent need for policy action. The historical milestone, which was this uh, greenhouse gas emission strategy, will need to be quickly followed by dedicated policies and other measures, measures. Because of the large price gap between conventional and clean energy technologies, ambitious and timely measures enabling strong, strong efficiency improvements and rapid fuel switching to low carbon fuels are vital in the maritime sector. Finally, um, rail uh, is one of the most energy efficient transport modes and currently accounts for 8% of global, global motorized passenger movements and 7% of freight movements, while only accounting for 2% of transport energy use. Urban and high-speed rail infrastructures have been scaling up rapidly over the past decade, laying the foundation for convenient low emissions transport within and between cities. And above all, China has been leading the way in deploying infrastructure in both of these categories. In urban environments, rail is unparalleled in its throughput capacity, the potential to move large volumes of passengers uh, over uh, tight corridors in a, in a tight amount of time. It can therefore reduce congestion, save value, valuable and scarce space, and generate wider economic benefits. High-speed rail is the only established low-carbon alternative to aviation for short-distance trips, and freight rail is the only alternative to long-distance inland in -land road freight transport. So summing up the challenge for the transport sector as a whole, an integrated, coherent, and coordinated set of policies will be needed to put the transport sector on the SDS pathway. Measures must be put in place at various levels of jurisdiction within multi-country regional blocks, at national and sub-national levels, and within cities, and they must spur progress in managing travel demand to reduce the frequency of trips, distances, travels, and distances traveled and the dependence on cars, so the so-called avoid shift approach, improving the energy efficiency or the fuel economy, if you like, of vehicles, increasing the availability and use of low carbon fuels. In addition to CO2 emissions, the SDS targets air quality improvements. Adopting cleaner fuels and enacting tighter emission control standards for vehicles would improve outdoor air quality in the developed and developing world alike. So now I'm going to uh, pass the floor to my colleague Thibaut, who will talk about the building sector. Thanks, Jacob. The building sector accounts for 28% of energy-related CO2 emissions. 
um, and uh, around 55% uh, of global electricity. As you can see, emissions from buildings hit an all-time peak in 2018 after a three-year leveling off. Part of this increase was due to extreme weather that raised energy demand for heating and cooling. In fact, heating and cooling represented one-fifth of the total global increase in final energy demand in 2018 across all sectors uh, of the energy space. space. This trend needs to reverse, putting the sector on track to decouple growing energy service provision in buildings and subsequent emissions. As you can see in the SDS, buildings-related emissions dropped by a third by 2030. Addressing building envelopes is particularly important because of their long lifetimes that can impact energy and emissions for 50, 70 years or longer. Yet, building envelopes continue to be way off track globally. Expansion of mandatory building energy codes that impact building energy performance for decades has seen little progress in recent years, although there has been some positive directions in a handful of countries such as India, Argentina, Nigeria, Mexico, and others that are working to update or implement building energy codes sometimes up to the near-zero energy performance standard, such as in France. These efforts need to scale up, not only to expand, but also to strengthen building energy codes everywhere, so that high-performance buildings become the market norm, representing half of all new construction by 2030. Efforts also need to focus on improving the performance of buildings already in place today, in advanced economies like the US or the EU, more than half of buildings that will be standing in 2050 already exist today. So policies need to push for deep energy renovations and market solutions that reduce energy, uh, energy demand uh, in existing buildings. And it's not just about energy and emissions. Delaying action to 2030 on high performance construction and renovation would increase spending on energy by households and businesses by, by as much as 2.5 trillion USD over the next 30 years. It's more than 2.5 years of operational expenditures for heating and cooling. Heating also continues to be off track. The share of fossil fuel technologies used for space heating and hot water production has remained almost constant at around 60% since 2010. And the vast majority of electrical heating is using inefficient conventional technologies. This graph shows market shares, but on a positive note, there has been some progress on improving overall heating equipment performance. But improvements need to pick up quickly. In the SDS, coal and oil boilers are progressively phased out. Natural gas equipment is shifted to more efficient technologies, such as electric and hybrid heat pumps and renewable technologies, such as solar thermal. By 2030, those clean energy technologies represent around 30% of new heating equipment sales, a tripling over current levels. We added a new analysis to TSEP this year, tracking heat pumps in buildings. Nearly 18 million households purchased a heat pump in 2018, up from 14 million in 2010. However, most of this growth is due to higher sales of reversible units, but they may only be used for air conditioning. Globally, heat pumps still only provide only 3% of heat in buildings. To be in line with the SDS, this share needs to triple in the coming decades. And the good news is that heat pumps have a green light for deployment. Our analysis shows that the carbon footprint of a typical electric pump today uh, is still better than a condensing gas boiler, even when the carbon footprint of the electricity generation is taken into account. About 90% of heating needs worldwide could be met with a heat pump at a lower carbon footprint and much higher efficiency levels. It is true in major heating markets, as you can see on the green on the map, in North America, Western Europe, Eurasia, and even China. But costs and market barriers need to be addressed. Upfront purchase prices need to come down in many markets to be competitive with other technologies, and effort is needed to make heat pumps more readily adaptable in different building contexts. Cooling is one of the blind spots of the energy system, but recent progress under the global initiative of the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Program are helping to find cool solutions for feverish planets. Yet, 
mandatory energy performance standards globally are not keeping up with rapidly growing demand for cooling services in buildings. They are, they are also not keeping pace with what is actually technically feasible. What people are buying is often less than half the performance of readily available energy efficient technologies. To be on track, METS need to expand in coverage and strength, pushing for a 50% improvement in AC performance over the next decade. R&D support is also needed to deliver much more efficient technologies, for example, in humid climates. Lighting is on track to meeting climate goals thanks to a, sur a surge of LED sales, representing around 40% of the global market in 2018. However, continued robust growth is needed so that LEDs make up over 80% of sales by 2030. Current trends suggest, however, that fluorescent, halogen, and incandescent lamps continue to dominate many markets. Efforts need to continue in the construction, but also and especially in the replacement segment. This could be supported by policies such as minimum energy performance standards and bulk procurement programs. For instance, India successfully deployed 350 million LED lamps since 2015, which are on average 50% more efficient than conventional alternatives. Remaining innovation gaps consist in defining and enhancing LED light quality. Policymakers need to identify best metrics for regulations, and testing procedures will have to keep up with technology progress. There are also other savings from smart luminaires and building energy management systems that could be tapped into. Let me close this building section with data centers and networks whose service demand is soaring. Global internet traffic has tripled in the past four years and is expected to triple again by 2022. All of this data and internet traffic, of course, requires rapidly expanding data centers and networks, each of them accounting for about 1% of global electricity use or more than electricity use in the UK when combined. We estimate that continued huge gains in efficiency can help keep energy demand relatively flat, despite exponential growth of demand in, uh, for these services. You can see on the chart for data center electricity use that we predict an increase of only 3%. This is largely due to the continued shift from smaller inefficient data centers to very efficient large-scale cloud and hyperscale data centers. On the data network side, we could see a range of outcomes depending on near-term efficiency trends. By 2021, we could see an increase of 70% of or a decrease of 15%, largely depending on the scale of continued efficiency gains. The direct energy used by these digital technologies is only one part of the story. These technologies underpin the opportunities for efficiency, productivity, and safety across the energy system. That was for buildings. Now let me turn it over to Louis for the last section on energy integration. Thank you, Thibault. Uh, so we move now to a sector we call uh, energy integration um, as an umbrella term which encompasses a set of uh, cross-cutting technologies like smart grids, like demand response, like storage or hydrogen, that together kind of underpin uh, the transformation to a multi-directional uh, smart energy system with active cost customer participation with high shares of viable renewables uh, that we see in the sustainable development scenario. So this, this uh, first figure uh, captures how investment has uh, progressed in many of these technologies, like smart meters, uh, like automation of distribution grids, power electronics, uh, EV chargers that are ready for smart charging, uh, so for charging not when it's uh, best for the individual consumer, but for the network, uh, and for other digital uh, grid infrastructure. So what we see here in this figure is that although smart grid investments rose 10% uh, in 2018, these technologies overall still represent a small share of all investment in network infrastructure. However, what we see there on the right-hand side on the y-axis um, is that the share of investment from digital grid infrastructure 
has been steadily increasing over time and is now around 8%. Uh, in this sense, overall in the sector, particularly here when we look at these smart grid technologies, further efforts are needed, uh, particularly implementing regulatory frameworks that can recognize, that can reward investment in new digital technologies, and then, in other words, called non-wire alternatives to traditional grid uh, transmission distribution grid uh, extensions. We move now to energy storage, which as you might have seen at the outset, uh, this year we are marking uh, green, so on track with the SDS. Um, first, it's important to remember overall that energy storage is not just about uh, batteries or this ambitious smart grid vision. We mustn't forget the flexibility that can be tapped from traditional technologies like pump hydro storage, which today accounts for more than 90% uh, of all storage capacity worldwide. When we look at batteries, however, uh, they're growing at an impressive pace. So as we reveal in this, this year's TSEP, battery storage deployment reached a record level in 2018, nearly doubling from 2017 uh, to reach over three gigawatts in terms of storage capacity, or if we look at it in terms of storage volume, we reach around uh, eight uh, gigawatt hours. Here we see the overall deployment by region in terms of uh, what are the some of the uh, leaders in both grid scale and behind the meter combined. Uh, leading country was again uh, Korea, followed by China, the United States, and Japan and, and Germany. The second big story of the year um, was the expansion of behind the meter storage, which was particularly strong, almost three times that of 2017. That's the bright blue color you see there. Uh, in this category, deployment reached record levels last year. Uh, with significant growth in Korea, in Australia, and Japan, in Germany, and finally in the United States. So what we've seen overall is that new markets have emerged quite quickly wherever governments uh, and utilities has created supportive mechanisms or market designs. Last year, for example, in Southeast Asia and in South Africa. What this indicates is that storage continues to need strong policy support, particularly through changing, through evolving market designs and mechanisms that continue to value the flexibility and other services that storage uh, can provide uh, compared to other uh, technologies. When we look at what's happening in 2019, what's in the pipeline, projects announced in development also herald a bright 2019. So South Africa made an important commitment uh, last year to, distrib uh, to distribute energy storage with up to almost 1.5 gigawatt hours of storage planned. Um, the project pipeline in many countries like Korea, the US and Europe remain strong. And elsewhere, there was a big flagship initiative uh, announced by the World Bank with uh, $1 billion uh, to finance energy, uh, battery storage in developing countries. Overall, in storage, recent trends are in line with the deployment growth needed to reach the SDS, the sustainable development scenario, by 2030, which is around 200 gigawatts. Uh, however, uh, storage starts from a low base, uh, so installations need to continue multiplying at this 2018 rate for the next 10 years. Moving on to uh, hydrogen. So in 2018, hydrogen maintained its recent momentum. Um, all six new CCS projects around the world related to hydrogen in some way, and there was notable policy push from France, from Korea, from Japan. However, it is important to look at the big picture. Today, there are around 70 million tons uh, of hydrogen uh, in use, uh, mostly for oil refining and chemical production, um, as you see in this figure, uh, but uh, overall almost exclusively used in industry. The hydrogen that we have in use today is currently produced in dedicated processes from fossil fuels. That's what you see at the top of the, of the figure. Uh, and that has significant associated CO2 emissions, or also produced, uh, what you see there at the bottom of the graph, uh, as a byproduct, largely also from fossil fuel processes. A very small amount is produced from electricity, which is that bright yellow band that you see uh, there, the, the thin yellow band there. Um, the vision for producing low carbon hydrogen would need either applying CCS uh, at a large scale to the bright purple section there at the top, or significantly growing the electrolyzer band in this psyche diagram. So to try hydrogen, we look at uh, three main indicators. First, the extent to which low carbon hydrogen is used in the existing industrial application for hydrogen. Second, we look at the deployment in new sectors uh, in which it's clean burning, it's storability, make it a candidate clean energy technology for electricity storage, for heat, 
for steel production, low carbon fuels, and also some transport sector applications. And then finally, we look at the scale up, improvements, cost reduction in cross cutting technologies such as electrolyzers, fuel cells, and hydrogen production with PCUs. So I will fo focus just on uh, electrolyzers, which, as I said, is a cross cutting technology, enables the production of clean uh, burning storable hydrogen fuel from electricity and, and water. So installations in the last two years, uh, we are valuing them at around 20 million US dollars to 30 million uh, per year. Almost all of the 230 or so projects that have come online since the year 2000 have had significant government support, uh, and this continues for the recently announced project. However, a key metric that we track uh, in TCEP for hydrogen and for the sustainability of, the, of hydrogen deployment is the size of the largest individual project installed. In 2018, this was 10 megawatts, and this is still below the size that is needed to demonstrate accelerated scale-up. For an ammonia plant, for example, the scale that is needed is in the hundreds of megawatts, if not on the gigawatt scale. Larger projects of 100 megawatts are announced, however, and a 20 megawatt project in Canada is under construction. So finally, just to invite you to look in, uh, more in depth at these trends and many more in an in-depth report that we are launching tomorrow, focused exclusively on a deep dive on, on hydrogen. So that concludes the uh, uh, presentation portion of this uh, webinar. Thank you again to uh, all the colleagues uh, who presented today. Um, so thank you all um, and your colleagues for all the work on TCEP. As you would imagine, an immense amount of work, uh, literally dozens of uh, colleagues from around the IA, across sectors, across technologies, looking for the latest, very latest numbers and analyzing those numbers and trends and what, what do they mean. So we hope that this is a really useful resource for everybody. Again, there is a web portal where you can find all of this information we presented and much, much more. And what we hope is a very user-friendly uh, user friendly kind of uh, format. Let me do one other thank you to uh, George Camilla, who will moderate the question part of this webinar, who uh, helped keep us all on track um, with deadlines and organize the uh, whole part of TSEP. So thank you, George, for all of your leadership and, and efforts. And again, thanks to all our uh, terrific analysts and, uh, and, and, and great colleagues throughout the IA. George, over to you for the Q&A. Thanks, Dave. Um, so we've got a few questions coming in. Um, so feel free to, to, to send us additional questions uh, using the, the GoToWebinar function. Uh, so the first question we have is on renewables. Um, on slide 17, could you please explain what change in policy in China caused the flat growth on solar PV and wind? Um, so thank you very much for the question. Um, so I'll start with solar PV. Um, China has two major challenges in terms of the solar PV uh, deployment. Uh, one is the cost of subsidies. Uh, China has a relatively, uh, used to have, not anymore, but a relatively high feed-in tariff, uh, and the cost of subsidies increased significantly with the exponential growth. The second one is the grid integration. Uh, curtainment level is, uh, is increasing in China for solar PV. It was very low uh, because of the lower levels of deployment. Uh, in order to address this challenge, China last year in May uh, decided to change the policy towards a more competitive uh, structure, uh, changing to, from the feed-in tariffs, uh, and started to put caps on the deployment. Uh, so that's why 2018 uh, solar PV additions declined in China from uh, 53 gigawatts in 2017 uh, to 44 gigawatts in 2018, about 10 gigawatts down. This is due to the caps that the uh, Chinese government introduced. Um, for the wind, uh, wind additions had have been declining in China since 2016, uh, even 15 when it's peaked. Uh, this is uh, highly due to the grid integration challenges and curtailment. Uh, China uh, established a notification uh, system uh, where uh, some of the provinces uh, with high curtailment levels were not allowed to build new capacities. And, uh, and uh, these policies are basically uh, implemented, and that's why we saw a significant decline in wind additions in China. Uh, this was last year compensated by higher growth in the in the United States, uh, and uh, that's why we saw a, a slight increase. In 2018, one last point before uh, I give it to the other question. 
uh, that uh, curtailment actually improved in China, uh, and we saw a slight increase uh, in Chinese editions, especially in the Inner Mongolia province. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, so we've got a question on heat pumps. Uh, slide 48, is there any detailed study of readiness of heat pump deployment as well as their potential in reducing CO2 emissions? Well, thanks for the question and for the interest in uh, this year's edition in TCEP about heat pumps. So readiness can mean multiple things for heat pumps. Uh, it can be about environmental impact, as suggested by the end of the question. In this case, we have taken data on the CO2 intensity in electricity production and compared this to uh, the approximate uh, seasonal, seasonal efficiency factor for heat pumps uh, in order to estimate what would be the environmental CO2 carbon footprint of a heat pump over its lifetime, also predicting it towards um, its use over its lifetime. Um, and we have compared it to the most efficient gas boilers available. Um, the assumptions and efficiencies will depend, of course, on um, climate, um, temperature, and also on market maturity. And the readiness level you've seen uh, on, the, on the map can, um, is expected to improve along with the decarbonization of the power sector. Um, you can find the results uh, in TSEP on the web portal, as well as in our publication uh, that we did for the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue. Uh, I can send you the link uh, if you send an email to one of our colleagues here. Now, if readiness means uh, market readiness, uh, we also analyzed uh, market barriers in a case study we did for heating and cooling strategies in Canada. Most of the innovation gaps around heat pumps are actually around opportunities to make them more attractive. And maybe, maybe without entering into the details, it can be about, for example, addressing the ratio between the cost of electricity and the cost of natural gas, uh, as sometimes the difference in performance is not enough to offset the difference uh, in the gas prices and the electricity prices. Um, attractivity also means uh, multiple services, for example. I'm thinking about demand side response, but also about the possibility to provide space heating, hot water, and space cooling in a single equipment, which means lower manufacturing costs and efficiency improvements. Um, and other challenges are, are of course, not uh, technical. Uh, for example, in many capitals in, in Europe, such as uh, here in Paris, it's very difficult to install a heat pump for space constraints. So you can find all of these barriers in our uh, report we did for Canada. Uh, I can send you the link as well if you, if you send an email. Thanks, Thibault. Uh, the next question is about industry. How important is it to apply CO2 limiting policies around the world in different countries at the same time? I mean, if we, have, if we will have one country as a locomotive and others following it, will it be as efficient or is it crucial to implement limits simultaneously? So thanks for that question on industry there. This is a complex topic, but in short, I would say that it is indeed very important to coordinate uh, CO2 policies. Uh, mandatory uh, CO2 emissions policies, whether levied via a carbon tax or a cap and trade scheme, are, are key examples of how we could level the playing field for industrial producers around the world. This is a particularly important concept to the industry sector because the materials that it produces are so highly traded. Um, and with one country applying a, a CO2 emissions policy that is in, balance, is in balance with respect to another, you can start to see uh, carbon leakage occur. So coordination um, and ensuring uh, competitiveness is maintained in, in markets across the world for these materials is indeed a, a more efficient way. On the locomotive point, there are certain regions around the world, notably Europe and also Japan and the US, that are at the kind of forefront of some of the development of the technologies that we require, but these uh, are not the regions where we are likely to see uh, the majority of the growth in industrial output. So technology transfer will also be a key um, mechanism that will be important to achieving the emissions reductions in the industry sector that we outline. Right. Um, we've got a question on transport. Um, you mentioned that improvements in car fuel economy are slowing down, uh, but if EV sales, as you say, are growing so quickly, what's behind this slowdown? Right. So uh, one of the drivers for this is the fact that diesel car sales have fallen rapidly in, across several major vehicle markets, especially in Europe, which relies heavily on, on uh, diesel powertrains. Since diesel cars tend to be more efficient than equivalent gasoline vehicles, the shift away from diesel has impeded 
fuel consumption reductions. In the largest of uh, EU's markets, the diesel market share has declined by anywhere between 5 and 15 percentage points since 2014. Uh, and this has been replaced only partially by more efficient electrified powertrains, uh, by hybrids, by plug-in hybrids, by battery electric vehicles, and even a few uh, fuel cell electric vehicles. Another uh, driver is that despite the fact that you see ongoing efficient in efficiency improvements within each vehicle segment, um, consumers have been tending to demand not just in North America, but increasingly also in Europe and uh, Asian uh, markets, larger vehicles. Um, and as that demand for things like SUVs or crossovers uh, continues to grow, um, this has also led to a slackening in the uh, rate of improvement of uh, fuel economy or vehicle efficiency. Um, there are even some markets like uh, the U.S. where uh, the regulatory policy is different for passenger cars than for light trucks, and the share of light trucks in the overall passenger vehicle market has continued to grow. Um, finally, there are kind of structural reasons uh, just in terms of the amount of vehicles being sold in advanced economies versus, versus emerging economies. Um, since emerging markets have continued to grow in terms of overall global sales and since the average fuel economy in emerging markets tends to be worse than the uh, weighted average fuel economy of vehicles sold in advanced markets, this has also led to a slowdown in overall global fuel consumption uh, gains. All right. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, we've got another question on um, renewables. While talking about large deployment of solar and wind to the grid, what steps are being taken to make the grid equally responsible, uh, responsive to the variability of renewables to ensure grid security? Um, thank you very much, uh, George. Um, so this is a grid integration uh, question. So first of all, um, the share of uh, variable renewables such as wind and solar in most of the countries in the world is below 5% today. Uh, and it will remain in most of the countries below 5% in our forecast uh, period. So uh, there are uh, uh, countries who have higher shares of renewables, which is 10 to 15 to 20%, 25 to 30%, or even more than uh, uh, close to 50% today, such as Denmark. Um, so we have to differentiate the challenges that each uh, type of country faces. In this case, at the IEA, uh, during the grid integration uh, studies, we have six phases of deployment. Uh, we define them, phase one, two, three, four, five, and six. And in the first, um, first phase, it's basically low uh, levels of uh, variable renewable deployment. And then in this case, uh, we suggest countries to basically optimize their system, use better forecasting technologies uh, for renewables, also demand. Uh, and also optimize what is flexible in the market uh, already today, such as gas plants or hydropower plants or uh, pumped hydro storage. Um, so overall, this grid integration uh, challenge is not a technical challenge. It's a cost challenge. Uh, you can basically simply integrate 100% of renewables with a very expensive uh, uh, battery technology, but the goal is not to uh, uh, spend uh, uh, a lot of money on this, but actually optimize uh, uh, your system first. And when you move up to the stage, then uh, you will consider other uh, measures uh, such as uh, uh, adding flexibility investments, such as uh, gas plants or hydro power plants, uh, or moving towards uh, at higher shares of deployment uh, um, and, uh, and additional uh, storage uh, or seasonal storage uh, uh, capabilities uh, to the system. Uh, beyond that, obviously, you require to look at the demand as well, uh, which means uh, sector coupling and uh, unlocking the demand response, which is, by the way, one of the cheapest way of flexibility, which is untapped in many countries today. Uh, so it is important to look on the demand side uh, and looking at the other uh, power to fuel technologies uh, and, uh, and uh, power to technologies, uh, hydrogen and uh, green hydrogen and so on and so forth. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tammy. Um, so, um, somewhat related to that um, about demand response, you mentioned demand response as part of energy integration. Is that included under smart grids, uh, or do you follow it separately? All right. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so, the first thing maybe to say is that we, while we track some of these integration technologies separately and individually, when we look at our scenarios, like how we think about the future energy system, what we track is an overall need for flexibility. 
And then there are a number of different measures that can that can provide that flexibility, many of which uh, Amy in the previous question has already outlined. So there is no, we don't see a, a need for storage or a need for demand response per se, but a need for flexibility and then different solutions that can that can provide it. So in terms of demand response, yes, we track it separately. I invite you to go uh, to our TSEP website and and look at the information that we that we outlined there. Today we have around 40 gigawatts of demand response around the world, uh, which is not much. Um, most of it is this traditional programs. Uh, There's mostly from large industry, what's called interruptibility services, uh, and some commercial programs, very little from the residential sector. Uh, however, there's a huge potential. So every year in the World Energy Outlook, we look at how much potential technically could be tapped from the demand side to provide flexibility for the grid. And what we see is that even today, we have around 4,000 terawatt hours of potential, which is around a fifth of the world's electricity demand. And in our scenarios looking forward in 2040, uh, we see almost 10,000 uh, terawatt hours. So it's a huge potential that right now is not being tapped. Uh, why is it not being tapped? So there has been a lot of progress in deploying physical infrastructure, some progress, particularly in some regions, deploying smart meters, advanced meter infrastructure, and making some of these smart grid investments that are needed to, to be able to exploit the demand response. But there has been a lot less progress in terms of market design, in terms of evolving regulation, um, so that these business models that uh, allow for aggregation, for pulling together demand resources and then bidding into, into wholesale electricity markets uh, to, to enable this, this kind of services. Uh, so in that sense, there's a lot more progress that needs to be done to, to advance the demand response. And that's why this year, as you will see on the website, we're rating it uh, yellow, more progress needed. Great. Thanks, Luis. Uh, so we're, we're coming to the end of our hour and a half. Uh, one final question um, on the power sector. Uh, what impact will current infrastructure in the power system have on emissions in the future, and how does it fit in an SDS world? So that is correct. Emissions linked to current infrastructure, uh, such as power plants or vehicles or industrial boilers, is to a certain extent locked in uh, for the future, because investments that have been made will not be simply discarded um to to reduce emissions so this if we we've uh, looked at this uh last year and this means that about 550 gigatons of co2 emissions are locked in over the period to 2014. this is over 90 percent of co2 emissions allowed in the SES. So this leaves little room to maneuver. We need to add uh, a lot of sustainable and low carbon energy infrastructure wherever possible, but we also need to make a better use of the infrastructure currently in place. Um, this means that we need to improve the efficiency and we need to pay much greater attention to the emissions involved in uh, bringing fossil fuels to the consumers. Uh, for example, not all sources of oil and gas are equal in their emission impact. Um, and of course, we should deploy much more innovative technologies such as carbon capture, utilization and storage, and hydrogen. To take an example, uh, if we look at coal-fired power plants, they account for one-third of energy-related CO2 emissions today. And due to their long lifetime to current projects under construction, they will represent more than one-third of cumulative locked-in emissions to 2014. The vast majority of these emissions are related to projects in Asia where core plants are just 11 years old on average. So most of these still have uh, decades to operate. This is less of a concern for uh, the US and Europe, uh, where the average age is over 40 years. 
and most plants are nearing their, the end of their operational life. Mm. So there is a need to create additional room to maneuver uh, through policies and measures that target the deployment of carbon capture, utilization and storage, and that limit the lifetime of unabated coal plants um, and reduce the operation of uh, remaining facilities. Thanks so much, Davide. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, uh, for all your questions. Um, there's a couple more um, we'll, we'll take offline. Um, thanks for all your time um, for joining us today, and thank you to all the authors, uh, for Dave, for his leadership. Uh